Today's topic is evolution. A scientist's approach to evolution. An approach where evidence is examined and hypotheses formed and predictions made and tested. Along the way, many will applaud and many will object. But both reactions are inappropriate. Science, as a discipline, does not cheer for a given outcome of its experiments and investigations. We will not start from scratch today. The topic is too vast. But we will touch on enough detail to give a solid underpinning for the following conclusions. Common descent is a fact. All life on Earth is related through common ancestry. Changes with a single species occur, so-called microevolution. Species themselves come and go, so-called macroevolution. We will not discuss God or intelligent design, worthy topics, but not for science. We will not discuss the origin of life, a worthy scientific topic, but not necessary for our examination of evolution, and a topic which is a lot less certain than our current knowledge of evolution. Universal common descent is the concept that every living thing on Earth is related to every other living thing on Earth, genealogically, genetically related. All modern organisms are descended from one original species. And while in its simplest form, there is a genetic linear progression that branches and forms a tree-like pattern, common descent is not restricted to this linear pattern. That is, different species might recombine and generate hybrids, or genetic material may cross from symbiont to host. Or perhaps by man's own hand, genetic material may be implanted wholesale in another species. None of this changes the fact that every living thing on Earth is related to every other living thing on Earth. A common misconception is that some modern species are descended from other modern species. This is rarely the case. Instead, closely related modern species evolve from a common ancestor that is neither one nor the other. Humans did not come from chimps. Both humans and chimps came from a creature that had more primitive features than either modern humans or modern chimps. If it is to be called science, it must be testable. And for almost 150 years, the research community has done every test imaginable to examine evolution and common descent. And for 150 years, not a single test has ever failed to validate that all life on Earth comes from one common ancestor. Here are just a few of the prestigious scientific organizations that accept this as proven fact. Check it out. So let's look at a little of what has been done. When you look at a phylogenic tree of life diagram, derived from the idea of common descent, 
you immediately notice the pattern of groups within groups. This nesting is unique to the common descent idea. The statistical analysis of these characteristics of organisms grouped with this idea is unusually successful. Species are essentially never found that combine characteristics of different groupings. For example, snakes and lizards are never found with feathers. Only birds have feathers. Birds and crocodiles are never found with differentiated teeth. Only non-marsupial mammals have a placenta. Birds and mollusks are never found with placenta. Only mammals have hair and mammary glands. Amniotic eggs are never found in fish or arthropods. A mix and match of characteristics like these would make it extremely difficult to objectively organize species into nested hierarchies. The consistency of nested hierarchies is another success for common descent. Common descent requires that fossils exhibit a succession of forms from the earliest to the latest. There are many examples but we will show just a few. Since birds evolved from dinosaurs, we expect to find reptile-like fossils with feathers, bird-like fossils with teeth, or bird-like fossils with long reptilian tails. And in fact, we have found very complete sets of reptile-to-bird transitional fossils. There are no morphological gaps. All have the expected possible shapes and forms. In the reptile to mammal sequence, we also have a terrifically complete series of intermediate forms. From the Paleocosora, the Rhapsida, Cynodonta up to primitive mammalia. The fossils reveal that mammals gradually evolved from a reptile ancestor. It is worthwhile to pause here and examine a type of change that is often mentioned as impossible. It appears that two of the bones in the middle ear of mammals correspond to two bones that are in the jaw structure of reptiles. The green and red bones in these diagrams are the bones in question. And if we look at the developing fetus, sure enough, two developing bones in the reptile head become part of the jaw, while the corresponding bones in the mammal fetus become part of the middle ear. How can jaw bones evolve to become middle ear bones? The fossil record is now so thorough, including a complete skull of Hadracodia mui and cranial and jaw material from Ripponomimus and Gobi conodon. We can see the progression as it happened. And in the case of our own emergence, there are more than two dozen transitional fossils intermediate between modern humans and our own ape-like ancestors. But it is not enough to simply find the transitional fossils. They also must satisfy the sequence test. That is, the ages of the fossils must match the progression from primitive form to more modern form. Dating fossils is a relatively straightforward process, using several methods to cross-check the ages determined. Some care must be taken to ensure the dates considered are the earliest appearance of each fossil, since there is no reason a transitional form must go extinct before a modern form appears. 
and there is no reason a successful form cannot endure for long periods of time with very little change. The modern crocodile can boast of 100 million years, and the cockroach, which has been around for 280 million years. But back to sequencing. If we consider our reptile to bird example and date the intermediate forms, we find that they are in precisely the right order. A wider view also passes the sequence test. Prokaryotes appear first, followed in order by sponges and starfish. Fish, amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. We will return to this point later. In the examination of structure of organisms, we frequently find organs that either have no function or have a modified function completely out of character with the structure. For example, wings are very complex structures specifically adapted for flying. So why do ostriches have wings? Ostrich wings are certainly not useless to the ostrich, but they are certainly useless as wings. The vestigial blind eyes of the mole and cave-dwelling fish and salamanders are easily explained only by reference to previous ancestors who had need of eyes. Snakes are clearly the descendants of four-legged reptiles. Most pythons still carry vestigial pelvises hidden beneath their skin. These useless pelvises are not even attached to the vertebrae, but simply float in the abdominal cavity. Many legless lizards carry rudimentary vestigial legs underneath their skin, undetectable from the outside. Dandelions reproduce without fertilization, yet they retain flowers and produce pollen, useless to the dandelion, but not to its ancestors. Many flightless beetles still carry their fully formed wings of their ancestors, but carry them underneath fused wing covers. Human herbivore ancestors are responsible for our useless wisdom teeth and our vermiform appendix. And our tailbone is a developmental remnant tying us to our ancestors who had external tails. There are no vestigial structures that were not previously functional in an ancestor. All vestigial organs make sense only in the framework of evolution. And of course we do not find vestigial organs that argue against evolution. No nipples in amphibians, or vestigial feathers on mammals. No primates carry vestigial horns, or degenerate wings. We do not find arthropods with leftover backbones. No snakes have wing parts, and no humans have gizzards. If creatures evolve from one another, there should be a geographical trail. Marsupials are a good example. With few exceptions, marsupials inhabit Australia. The possum and some South American species are explained by continental drift. South America and Australia used to be connected and split apart only after marsupials evolved. Conversely, placental mammals were virtually absent in Australia until we introduced them there. South America, Africa, and Australia share lungfishes, ratite birds like ostriches and emus, and toothed frogs, all of which occur nowhere else. Humans' closest living relatives are the great apes, indigenous to Africa so it is no real surprise to find that our own origins are there as well. A test closely related to vestigial sections 
addresses similarities in structure in spite of differences in the functions of that structure. If species evolve from another species, the new species must often adapt and modify existing body parts to do different tasks. If we examine the bone structure in primate hands and bat wings and bird wings and pterosaur wings and whale flippers and penguin flippers and horse legs and mole forelimbs and frog legs, we will find they all have the same bones in the same relative positions. The standard tree diagram easily demonstrates why these different species have the same structure. That is, they have common ancestors who possess these structures. The fossil records again confirms this conclusion, as it readily provides a chronological progression of intermediate forms. We can occasionally find explanations for what appears to be bad design by tracing the source of body structure to our ancestors. The mammalian respiratory and gastrointestinal tracts cross one another, so we cannot swallow and breathe simultaneously. Why does this less than optimal anatomy exist? An ancient ancestor from the Devonian, a lungfish, swallowed air to breathe and the bladder that held the air was the precursor to our lungs. Humans have inherited this original design with the mouth connected to both the digestive and respiratory system even though it now causes problems. Given what we know of modern species dynamics and recent extinction rates, we know that the majority of organisms will eventually go extinct. Likewise, the majority of past organisms also go extinct. Thus, we should reasonably expect our ancestors had many other descendants and relatives that did not leave descendants which survive today. In short, we expect the majority of fossil species that we find should not be the actual common ancestors of modern species, but rather they should be related organisms that eventually ended in extinction. The oldest rocks on Earth are about four billion years old, and they are lacking any signs that life existed at that time. Some rocks from 3.5 billion years ago may contain fossil bacteria, but there is some controversy about them. The oldest well-accepted fossils are stromatolites that date about 3.4 billion years ago. The oldest eukaryote fossils, cells that have a nucleus, are about 1.75 billion years old. And another billion years passed until we see evidence for the first multicellular life about 750 million years ago. By 580 million years ago, we find evidence for animals in the form of small sponges and sea anemones and jellyfish. The creatures of the Cambrian, 540 million years ago, are mollusks, trilobites, worms, echinoderms, and primitive chordates. All of these species are extinct today. Over the next 200 million years, we finally see insects and fishes with jaws. But no amphibians, no reptiles, no land animals at all, no mammals or birds. On the plant side, it is during this period we first see ferns and later gymnosperms. But no flowers and no hardwoods. These show up much later. About 340 million years ago, we see tetrapods for the first time, and then amphibians. And later, 300 million years ago, we see the first small reptiles, all extinct today. From 220 million to 65 million years ago, the large reptiles and dinosaurs dominate the land and sea. 
life is varied. There are tens of thousands of species, all extinct today. During this period, we first see mammals. But there are no humans, apes, monkeys, dogs, cats, horses, whales, dolphins, bats, rats, or kangaroos. From 65 million years ago, we begin to see birds in hardwood forest and large animals that have shapes somewhat like modern animals. Of course, mammoths, giant sloths, and saber-toothed cats will go extinct, along with thousands of other species before we get to the present. Macroevolution is evident in abundance in the fossil record. Species come and go, and when they emerge, it is always from an ancestor. A useful definition of species is this. A species is a group of organisms that can interbreed. And as new species form from old species, there are all possible stages of interbreeding capability observed. There are countless cases of distinct species which can, in unusual or limited circumstances, form hybrids. One example is the West European carrion crow and the Asian hooded crow, which have distinct ranges meeting in a narrow zone where they interbreed and form hybrids. Another are the different Platte River species of suckerfish of the same genus which live together and only rarely interbreed. Some species, like the salamander in Satina, form a chain of interbreeding populations which loop around in a geographical feature. This is the Central Valley of California, and the salamanders inhabit the entire parameter of a valley. Neighboring populations can interbreed with themselves and other close neighbors. But as the mileage increase between small groups, they can no longer breed. And where the populations meet on the other side of the valley, they behave as completely different species. This salamander is a good example of new species being formed gradually, with the accumulation of small mutations resulting in separate species. These two goals were originally identified as distinct species in England since they didn't interbreed. However, there is a continuous ring of their hybrids extending to the east and the west all the way around the North Pole. Only in England are they incapable of interbreeding. Many other species can mate and produce viable hybrids, like lions and tigers or horses and donkeys, but the hybrid offsprings are infertile. The tree of life illustrates countless speciation events. Each common ancestor also represents at least one speciation event. Current estimates from the fossil record and measured mutation rates place the time required for full reproduction isolation in the wild at about three million years on average. Consequently, observations of speciation in nature should be possible but a rare phenomenon. However, evolutionary rates in laboratory organisms can be much more rapid than rates inferred from the fossil record. And speciation has been observed in many common lab organisms. Speciation of numerous plants, such as the hemp nettle, the primrose, radish, and cabbage, maize, and wire lettuce, has been seen. Some of the most studied organisms in all of genetics are the fruit flies. Many Drosophila speciation events have been extensively documented since the 1970s. Speciation in Drosophila has occurred by spatial separation, by habitat specialization in the same location, by changing courtship behavior, by disruptive natural selection, and by bottlenecking populations, among other mechanisms. Speciation events have also been seen in houseflies, 
Skull former flies, apple maggot flies, flower beetles, worms, mosquitoes, and various other insects. Green algae and bacteria have been classified as speciated due to change from unicellularity to multicellularity, and due to changes from short rods to long rods, all are results of selection pressures. Speciation has also been observed in mammals. Six instances of speciation in house mice on Madeira within the past 500 years have been the consequence of only geographic isolation, genetic drift, and chromosomal fusion. With two chromosomes joined together, it is called chromosomal fusion. Some of these Madeiran mice species have undergone nine chromosomal fusions in the past 500 years. It should be noted that a single chromosomal fusion is the primary genomic difference between humans and chimpanzees. Much as an inch is a unit that describes a length, and a knot is a unit that describes the rate of speed, there is a unit that describes how fast evolution happens. Let's call that unit a Darwin. It describes how fast some aspects or characteristics of an organism changes. One Darwin is a factor of 2.7 every million years. This factor is often used to evaluate whether there has been enough time since the beginning of life on Earth for the evolution of all the species who have ever lived. The average rate observed in the fossil record is 0.6 Darwins. And the fastest rate in the fossil record is 32 Darwins. So any rates faster than this in observations of evolution would ensure that there has been enough time. And the average rate of evolution observed in historical colonization events in the wild is 370 Darwins, over 10 times the required minimum rate. In fact, the fastest rate found in colonization events was 80,000 Darwins, or 2,500 times the required rate. Observed rates of evolution in lab experiments are even more impressive, averaging 60,000 Darwins, and as high as 200,000 Darwins, or over 6,000 times the required rate. A more recent paper evaluating the evolutionary rate in guppies in the wild found rates ranging from 4,000 to 45,000 Darwins. Note that a sustained rate of 400 Darwins is sufficient to transform a mouse into an elephant in just 10,000 years. One of the most extreme examples of rapid evolution was when the hominid cerebellum doubled in size within 100,000 years during the Pleistocene. But this rate was only seven Darwins. This rate converts to a minuscule 0.02% increase per generation at most. Watching a fetus develop reveals much about the ancestral history of that organism. A human embryo in its third week is a featureless disk of cells until a furrow appears and plows its way across the top layer of cells. This is the primitive streak. As the primitive streak then begins to shorten, it leaves a trail in the form of a tube of tissues. This is the notochord, a stiffening rod found in embryos of all chordates. In primitive vertebrates, it persists throughout life as the main axial support of the body. But in higher vertebrates, the spinal cord replaces it. But because our developmental heritage, the spinal cord cannot develop unless the nodal cord secretes the right chemical signals. The genome includes the information necessary for the embryo to develop properly. But the genome has a history. It has been passed down through a chain of ancestors, unbroken since the dawn of life. 
and it still goes through the motions of creating many of those ancestors. 300 million years ago, our ancestors were creatures who laid their eggs in water. These eggs were small and round and contained yolk sacs to sustain the embryo. This is the first stage of a human embryo. But we notice that our embryo goes through a stage where it takes the form of a flattened disc we can thank our reptile ancestors for this stage. When reptiles started laying their eggs with new hard shells on land, the embryos had to be supplied with a larger yolk to feed them through a long period of incubation. In order to accommodate this larger yolk, the embryo itself became a flattened disc squeezed between the yolk and the hard shell. The human embryo no longer needs a yolk sac, but even after millions of years, each human embryo is rolled out to form a germinal disc, reptile fashion, before rolling up again. There are many more times in fetal development in which evolutionary history plays a role. Human embryos all have temporary pharyngeal pouches which echo the gill pouches of our ancient fish ancestors. These pouches eventually became the structures that evolved from the gill pouches of fish. Structures that include the eustachian tube, middle ear, tonsils, parathyroid, and thymus. And of course it is not just physical structures themselves, but also the genes which control the development. Many of these genes controlling the development of human embryo are exactly the same genes that control the development of other creatures. In fact, some genes, like the Hawks gene, which regulate the location and shape of limbs and parts, are able to control the development of creatures as different as flies and mammals. If every living creature on Earth descended from one species that could perform life's basic functions, replication, metabolism, etc., then not only should we inherit those functional capabilities, but we should also inherit the structures used to perform these functions. So a testable prediction of the idea of common descent is that all life should have similar structures that execute life's basic processes. And they do. Down past the cellular level and down to the molecules that support life's processes. All life on Earth shares the same molecules that allow life to function. Regardless of species, the polynucleotides, like DNA and RNA, polypeptides, like proteins, and polysaccharides, like starches and glucose, are identical. DNA, RNA, and proteins all have the same chemical form in spite of the fact that there are dozens of possibilities that would work. All life uses the same four molecules adenine, cytosine, thymine, guanine in the DNA ladder although there are more than a hundred that could be used. All life bases its replication on the duplication of the DNA molecule. The proteins found in all life on Earth use the same 20 amino acids in their makeup, while there are almost 400 that could have been used. All life on Earth shares the same universal genetic code built into its DNA. The letters on the DNA ladder, taken three at a time, form coded instructions as to which amino acids should be joined together to form a protein. Every species on Earth uses the identical code to perform this function. Bacteria uses exactly the same code for making proteins that humans do. All life on Earth shares the same metabolic pathways. In all life, based on cells with a nucleus, from amoebas to blue whales, glucose is metabolized in the same 10 steps, in the same order 
using the same 10 enzymes. Thousands of new species are discovered yearly and have their DNA proteins sequenced examined. Nearly 50 million new bases are sequenced every day and everyone is tested of the theory of common descent. It passes every test. There are enough different possible genetic codes, all functionally equivalent, and all using the same amino acids, for every species that has ever lived to have its own unique code. If there were no common ancestor from whom all life inherited this code, it would make sense to expect a wide variety of codes. This would protect each species from interspecies viral infections. The lack of variety indicates common origin. Recently, we have sequenced and compared the entire genomes of both baker's yeast and a worm. The genes used by the yeast, a very primitive organism, are primarily those that deal with the core biochemical functions that all organisms must perform. It was expected and proved true that the worm contains most of these same genes. But the reverse is not true. Since the worm is a more modern creature than the yeast, the worm genes that deal with multicellularity are certainly absent from the yeast. But more than that, these extra genes are directly derived from the primitive genes that provide core cellular function. A larger study reveals, at the genetic level, newer genes are copiously created from more primitive forms in order to accommodate the requirements of more modern and more sophisticated organisms. Some proteins are found in every living eukaryote on Earth. Fruit flies and bats, octopi and hippos, protists and humans. One such protein is cytochrome C. It is found in the mitochondria, the energy generating parts of all eukaryote cells, and without it, the cells die. Experimenting with yeast, researchers have shown that human cytochrome C protein works for the yeast as well as its own. Indeed, they have substituted genes from fish, birds, horses, insects, and rats into the yeast as well, and all of these genes produce cytochrome C proteins that work for the yeast too. But the gene that codes for this protein has been buffeted with sequence mutations over the billions of years that it has existed. Essentially, all of these mutations are silent. Null sequence sections inserted in a gene that do not change the protein that is built from amino acids based on these genes. But these mutations do tell the genealogy of the owners. For example, humans and chimps have exactly the same amino acid sequence for this protein. It hasn't mutated in the six or seven million years since our lines separated. And our common gene is at most 10 amino acids different from all other mammals, confirming our close relationship with other mammals. The differences increase as we step further back in time and further from our own branch on the tree of life. The yeast itself has 51 amino acid differences from that of humans and chimps, and is one of the most distantly related organisms from humans having separated from our branch over a billion years ago. Researchers have discovered another point about cytochrome C protein. It is somewhat easy to make other proteins that serve the same function. In fact, there are more possible proteins that can perform this function than there are atoms in the universe. So why do all organisms on Earth use the same version? The answer is simple, really. We inherited the one we use from our common ancestor.
There are sections of an organism's genome called transposons that have no other function except for inserting copies of themselves elsewhere on the genome. And there are many very well-known sequences that do this. Two such sequences are signs, or short interspersed transposable elements, and lines, or long interspersed transposable elements. There are about 850,000 lines and one and a half million signs scattered throughout your genome, accounting for nearly 30% of the entire sequence. While they are useless to the genome and sometimes cause significant damage, they are useful to our investigations since essentially the only way for them to go from one organism to another is through direct DNA duplication and inheritance. Your lines and signs are given to your children. The parts of your DNA that make up your genes are relatively small sections scattered among other useful parts of your genome, as well as your lines and signs. Like fingerprints, the patterns recognizable in these non-gene sections are unique to individuals. They are similar in relatives and less similar in distant relatives. This is the basis of DNA fingerprinting. And since these sequences are passed down from parent to child, finding the same sequence in the same place in two different organisms is direct evidence that the two organisms have a common ancestor. Biologists have used this idea to demonstrate exactly how different species are genetically related. Here are two examples. Three different identical sign sequences are found in the same genome location of whales and hippos, which are closely related, while camels and pigs, which are not closely related to whales and hippos, do not have the same sequence. The most numerous sign element in your genome is called the ALU. In the human alpha globin cluster, there are seven ALU elements. And each one is shared with chimpanzees in the exact same seven locations, guaranteeing a common ancestor. When ALU elements are deposited on top of other ALU elements, the markers become a chronology of development. Very recent human ALU sequences have been used to trace historic and prehistoric human migrations. Since some individuals have new ALU insertions that other individuals lack. Another type of structure found in the genome is called a pseudogene. It is basically a gene that in some time in the past had errors occur in its regulatory sequence and quit functioning. Since these structures have no current function, the only reason multiple species would carry this pseudogene is common inheritance. There are very many examples of pseudogenes shared between primates and humans. One is the psi eta globin gene a hemoglobin pseudogene. It is not shared by all mammals, only the primates. And in primates, it is found in the exact same chromosomal location with the same mutations that destroyed its ability to function as a protein coding gene. A third type of structure found within the genome is also direct evidence of genetic relationships. Retroviruses like HTLV1, which cause a type of leukemia, and AIDS, make a DNA copy of their own viral genome and insert it into the host genome. If this happens inside the sperm cells or the egg cells, the retroviral DNA will be inherited by the descendants of the host. And these copies of the virus DNA are called 
endogenous retroviruses. In human DNA, there are about 30,000 endogenous retroviruses. There are at least seven distinct instances of identical retrogene insertions shared between chimps and humans. The phylogenic tree for cats provide another example. The standard phylogenetic tree has small cats diverging later than large cats. The small cats, for example, the jungle cat, European wild cat, African wild cat, black-footed cat, and domestic cat, share a specific retroviral gene insertion. In contrast, all other carnivores, which diverged earlier, lack this sequence. Let's examine how endogenous retroviruses, or ERVs, would behave within a model of evolution by common descent. Suppose an ancient creature, let's call it Primus mammalius, is the common ancestor of all modern mammals and is infected by a retrovirus that becomes endogenous. All of the Primus descendants would be expected to carry the same ERV, let's call it ERV1, in the same chromosomal location. Fast forward 30 million years. Different lineages have evolved and derived from the original common ancestor, and there are now many different types of mammals in existence, all carrying ERV1. A small rodent, let's call it Secundus mousis, is the common ancestor of mice and rats, and once again is infected by a new species-specific retrovirus that becomes endogenous. This is ERV2. In a different line, Secundus apis, the common ancestor of all great apes, acquires a third retrovirus, ERV3. Moving forward 30 million years again, a fourth ERV appears in mitochondrial Eve the common ancestor of all modern humans. Call it ERV4. As early humans spread out, a fifth ERV arises in a population that is isolated in Australia. So, ERV5 does not spread to other human populations. So what do we expect? Humans, chimps, mice, and rats should all possess ERV1. The mouse and rat genomes will also contain ERV2, the virus that infected their common ancestor, but not the primate-specific ERV3, ERV4, and ERV5 insertions. All great apes will share an identical ERV3 insertion. All humans will possess an ERV4 insertion that is not found in the chimps or other apes. In addition, some, but not all, humans will carry an insertion of ERV5. And of course, the rodent-specific ERV2 insertion will not be found in any primate species. Now that several genomes have been sequenced, we have begun to test these predictions. The patterns of ERV insertions observed in modern species exactly match the predictions made by the model described above. Some insertions are shared between humans and mice and represent truly ancient viral infections. Others are found only in primates and not the other species, obviously derived from the infection of the ancestral primate species after its divergence from other lineages. More modern insertions are found only in humans. While the youngest ERVs of all are found in some humans, but not in all. We do not find any examples of ERV insertions shared by, say, humans and mice, 
but not by chimps. Insertions are always shared by all species and only by those species that have a common ancestor. ERV insertions therefore provide excellent support for the idea of common descent. This evidence, viewed from a scientific perspective, together with a vast amount of similar data, is compelling evidence for the following conclusions. Common descent is a fact. All life on Earth is related through common ancestry. Changes within a single species occur, so-called microevolution. Species themselves come and go, so-called macroevolution. These are the facts of evolution. The mechanism or mechanisms that cause evolution to happen will be covered in another video.